that's if you're like trying to get into normal mode and you're like actively checking your location. But like, it's like, we're always pretty good. Yeah, we're always pretty good. Yeah, we're constantly like a big one. Okay, I'll keep it. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be a little more. That'd be mine. Wait, wait, what's this? Um, I just that one. Yeah. What? Yeah. 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 You should probably set up. I need to read a lot of it I'm ready. It's gonna run through the process. It's like I'm like actively working on my watch. It's like the next processor. I'm looking at my watch for the past five minutes. Do you want to see one? Oh, yeah. Oh, what the cards for Cool. Yeah, I just want to say that you can come out and do that. Bring the madness. Oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. There's no one on, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, that's why it was pointing yeah, just me. Because that's the problem. Yeah, that's why I have that set. So if you want to get people, so let them know YouTube's live. Yeah. I can send the, I was going to send the link in Discord. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, battery saver is just like this. It just shows you the time. Like this. 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 To our uh, Lunabotics <laughs> Critical Design <laughs> Review. <laughs> My name is Kevin. I am uh, kind of like half running this thing. Um, I'm going to get you guys started with the mechanical sub team here. We're going to go, each of the sub teams is going to give a little presentation. That would be the mechanical, the electrical, and the computer sub teams, plus a little extra stuff that we're working on. So I'll let mechanical take it from here.
I'm I'm Patrick. I am uh, I'm this I'm mechanical uh, sub team lead. I'm a uh, mechanical engineering grad student here at CSU. Hey, I'm Jared. I'm a member of the I'm Alex. I'm a sophomore at CSU, and I'm also a mechanical engineering and a member of this team. I'm Stefan. I'm a first year at CSU. Part of the mechanical tech team. So, most of you have been here before. You've all heard the chassis and track. We're still producing most of it just for flat stock. So, all the tracks are going to be mass produced from 8 inch 64 aluminum. Uh, Warren Jet has already agreed to do Jet has already agreed to do that for us for free. So we'll have those produced basically as soon as we get the stock. Uh, chassis, uh, it's kind of like an H-frame. You can still use two inch tube stock. Uh, it's going to be warm with the joints. Uh, other than those welds on the main track, there's going to be or on the main frame. Sorry, there's going to be no welding. All of it, all the rest of it's bolted. So there are new parts that have the place as needed. Um, for a few of the miscellaneous parts, they're just going to be made out of the, uh, the stock that's left over from what we produce all of our main parts. Stuff like the battery brackets, the, um, the electrical box brackets that don't really need to be you know, within two thou of whatever. They can just be whatever size so long as it works. So this is the excavation system, and I'm just going to go ahead and give a brief overview of it here so we can cover everything. So for the digging wheels, um, there's two of them. Those are mounted on either side of the bed. Um, they have nine scoops in total on either side, and they're going to be rotary driven. Um, for the bed, we're going to just go with aluminum, um, weld it together. Um, again, the wheels are going to be attached to either side of the bed. As you can see in the uh, picture on the top right, when the linear actuator is fully relaxed, like fully compressed, you can see that the scoop is actually going into the ground. And on the bottom right there, when the linear actuator is engaged slightly, I'd say about 10 degrees, the scoop is above the air, so uh, or above the ground. So that's how we'll be operating with the scoop above the ground. And then when we go to dig, we will um, <coughs> we will use the linear actuator to lower the wheel into the ground to pick up the material, which will be dumped into the bed and these, these scoops are hollow, or they don't have a back to them, so when it goes over the top of the scoop, over the arc, it dumps into the uh, little arm here coming off of the actual bucket, or the bed. Um, when we're going to dump the material, we will raise the linear actuator all the way up, max 60 degrees, and it will dump, it will just slide right off, in the, off of the back. Um, the motors we're going with here are 24 volt DC reduction motors. And then we have uh, the environmental uh, protection system, uh, which consists of a CO2 fire, fire suppression system and dust proofing for all the electronics. The CO2 fire suppression system um, is there for uh, the event that there is an actual fire. Um, we can put out uh, quickly and with Little, uh, it's no damage to any of the onboard electronics that we have. Uh, and then for dust proofing, we, ha we have it there uh, so that if and when we do uh, kick up dust through ex excavation, uh, the, all our sensors uh, don't get damaged because um, dust acts like uh, shards of glass and will damage anything that's really not metal, which would be bad. Uh, it shares an IPX a, a 6 to 7 rating with our motors and gearboxes. That way, we know um, dust won't get into those either. So, our mechanical building materials, the final cost of everything will be around $2,620. Everything in green, we're going to have manufactured at Warjet and Water Jet for us. And we pretty much have everything already ordered besides the little eighth. Uh, aluminum plate. So pretty much we're just waiting for things to come in. Anything else? Right. Leave it up if you want to take a look. Would anyone like more time to look at the build materials? Or anybody have any questions?
Thank you guys. Thank you. All right, so we are the electrical sub team. Or, go ahead. We're good. Hi, everyone. It's good to see you all again. Um, yeah, like Brian said, we're the electrical sub team. I'm Eric. I'm a senior EET student. This is Ryan Nelson. I'm, a, I'm a, also a senior EET student. Yeah, I'm Adam. I'm a freshman. I'm a uh, double EET. But you may as well be a senior because you're <laughs> smart. Um, we're here today is to present what we've gotten with the uh, um, electrical system layout from where we last started with the um, We're going to go through the bill of materials, the power budget, uh, the system layout, and we're also going to go over some of the 3D placement and schematic view that we have for um, where we're going to place our components and what we have in mind for, uh, for wiring uh, the sucker. All right. So I think we'll go to the first one here. Let me get my head out of the way. Um, we have our system layout uh, designed to be a, if you kind of think of an electrical schematic, right? Our goal for this is to make it easy to trace where everything is going to be from a flow chart standpoint, but also from an electrical standpoint. Um, our lines have the gauges listed for each wire, the power specs for each component. And this way with the software that we're using, we're able to easily make changes if we need to and scale around components. So um, we have some new additions to the layout from last time. Uh, you can probably see we've got it in Arduino Uno to interface with the ESP32. That'll be handling most of the Wi-Fi um, runs uh, for radio communication. Getting into it later, this system is primarily autonomous until that autonomy fails. Um, this system is subject to revision in terms of in terms of whether we may end up adding a second Pi or not for image processing. So you can see this Pi here may be followed up with a second Pi here that would handle the processing between the cameras here, the ESP32 with the Wi-Fi um, interfacing with the Arduino module. Um, another thing we've looked at is just getting an Arduino module that has Wi-Fi built in. Uh, so I think it's the latest Red 4 has a, excuse me, has a Wi-Fi module built into it that you can get for like 27 bucks or something like that. Um, so the link to the schematic is there if you'd like to check it out uh, for everybody watching from home. Um, but other than that, I mean, you know, we've, we've come a long way on this and I don't think this is going to be the last of it for sure. But um, this is where we're at. And um, if you have any questions, please. Um, let me say, let's get through the bill of materials first. Yeah. But then, if you have any questions, just please shoot us. Um, so, our bill of materials hasn't changed a ton, but you'll probably notice we've added some things. I'd like to draw your attention to this bad boy right here. Um, we have been looking at essentially getting a NVIDIA Jetson Nano to handle our image processing. So kind of how we described the um, the Raspberry Pi that would be doing that, we may potentially be doing that with the Jetson Nano. We'd like to purchase one, but this is not set in stone yet whether we will be implementing it or not. Any advice or recommendations for this or for implementing this would be greatly appreciated because otherwise we'll be strictly doing the Raspberry Pi setup that you saw previously. Otherwise, we've updated our power distribution board to a panel. A uh, little fun story about that power distribution board. It's not really a board. It's actually a full ass server cabinet panel. Um, and we were really worried about whether it was going to fit or not. But thanks to the mechanical team's expertise and um, thanks to Adam for discovering that 
uh, we were able to make sure that it was going to fit. Um, you'll see in a few slides here, but we actually have a box in the back of the robot that's going to have our components fitted. So um, we've also set it on the drive battery. It's a 25 amp hour uh, lithium iron phosphate uh, provided by uh, Renegade Batteries. Um, the system is going to be separated into two separate power systems. So actually, if we could go back a slide, just while this is fresh on my mind. Um, we have a logic battery for the five volt system. So you can think the Raspberry Pi, the Arduino, um, the LiDAR sensor, anything that's gonna be taking in five volts is gonna come from that logic battery pack that you see there, right? Um, otherwise, everything else is strictly 24 volts. That's being fed in through the 24 volt battery, um, which is gonna be connected to a kill switch. Um, so that's going to the motor controllers for the drive motors um, and into the individual stepper motors as well. So actually, let's go back to the build materials. Um, one thing that we're also implementing here that's not reflected on the schematic, um, we're also implementing digging motors. So they're significantly smaller than uh, what we're using for the um, the stepper motors that's going to be interfacing with that um, like wagon wheel system that you saw earlier. Um, we could use recommendations and advice on DWM controllers to use for those. Um, I'm thinking using Arduinos, but um, I'm sure there's a more professional industry standard way of doing that with DC motors. They're DC reduction motors at 27 RPM. Um, We've gone through them, gone through the size, made sure that they uh, the ones we have selected will effectively meet the mechanical team solutions. Um, I think that's it for this one. That's right. Um, then we have the cable bill materials. So this is a pretty quick one. Um, we're going to be using 14 gauge, 18 gauge. Um, and 12 gauge, which we're hoping will be either donated or provided by um, uh, a sponsor because we only need the 12 gauge for the wire going from the battery system um, to the distribution hub because that's where all our current is going to be summing is through that battery. Um, and um, please check me on this for everybody you know watching this at home. Um, for 12 gauge that can handle up to what is it 25 amps. Um, I chose 14 gauge. Correction, we chose 14 gauge because 14 gauge can handle um, 20 amps. Uh, so if it stalls out or gets to a point where that battery has to handle 20 amps of current, um, worst case scenario, um, that the motors will be able to handle that current. Um, and excuse me, that the batteries which have the 12 gauge wire, which are rated for 25 amps, will be able to handle any excess current or power that's thrown at it. Um, and then we've also added a wire installation sleeve component so that we can mesh wires together and make cable harnessing, shrink wrap for soldering when we inevitably have exposed wire. Um, I think that's the only thing that's missing on here um, is the 12 gauge wire. Um, I'm not sure whether to use granular or solid for that. So I could use some advice on that if, um, uh, if able. I mean, for, for our purposes, we try to use stranded wire as much as possible just because it's easier to bend. Um, but solid wire tends to have better um, capacity for carrying heavier loads of current. Uh, so I'm leaning towards that, but would greatly appreciate any advice or recommendations there. Yeah. Uh, it's the other way around. It's the other way around? Okay. Yeah. So all right. go with stranded. Okay, so go with stranded. All right, thank you. <laughs> um, all right, so good to have that corrected now. Um, I think the power budget's on the next slide speaking. Oh, no, no kidding. All right, we'll just get through this here. Actually, Adam, I think, you can speak to this better than 
most of us. Yeah. So in within our uh, we sort of converted uh, the SolidWorks model that the mechanical team built to a Fusion 360 model just for ease of access. Um, so they gave us this little electrical box that we have in the back of the rover, and we sort of just test fitted all the components we found. Uh, step files for all the components that we could. There were a few components like the power supply and a few sensors that didn't exist because they are proprietary. So we designed our own makeshift sort of our model just to make sort of their size within uh, the box. So we have a, a 3D model. It's at this link if anyone's interested in looking, but it's public. Anyone can access and view it if you want to just circle around the model and take a look at it. All right, um, let's go forward one. Okay. So then this is sort of a 2D schematic and layout of, of the electrical components that we have. So we have the two uh, stepper motor drivers on the left and right. But originally they were stacked in the center, which was actually the picture that we were just looking at on the previous slide. You can see that, you can see that the two black boxes are actually stacked on top of each other, but we switched that uh, because we want the, the current load to be equally distributed. So uh, it's important even for small things like that, um, that if we have them closer to the motors, we'll have less load. Um, and then we just have, sort of have a bunch of sensors everywhere. I can sort of go through. Right here, we have a relay module to switch the direction of the linear actuator so we can control what what direction it's going. When it's already at a set uh, revolution count, so it will just have a set speed. And then we have this entire box right here is the power distribution board. Um, and then there's a bunch of terminals on it. And then these are the two input and output ports um, for where the battery will go into. On top of the power distribution board, and we'll probably have to make 3D printed mounts for this, we'll have mounts for this. This is the DC motor controller for the uh, two digging motors. It's two channels, so it can run two DC motors at once, and you can control the percent of uh, rotational speed uh, with PWM signal. So you can use the uh, signal straight from the Pi to control those motors. Um, then we have a smaller buff converter right here. This is for um, our our uh, the bat the, our mini battery that's powering the Pi. It's going to step down the voltage from anywhere from like nine to twelve volts down to five volts. So that will basically be the only thing that the Pi is on because we have to have our sensors powered off of the main battery, like the lidar sensor. So then we have a bigger buff converter over here, which is twelve volt or twenty four volt down to five volts. So that will basically power the cameras if we end up tethering those separately, and then also the lighter sensor. Um, then we have a Raspberry Pi 4 right here. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory. Above that, we have our ESP32 board up there. And that's just for our backup communication. Well, it's for communication, but then it's also uh, for backup control if we lose a uh, connection or something fails. And in the middle right there, we have a kill, uh, kill e-stop button. So we have quick access to shutting off the main power to the buck. And then the final thing is right there, we have a PWM. Uh, this is a I, I squared C uh, PWM splitter. So it basically takes like two pins from like an Arduino or a Pi. It has like a timer and like a data transfer wire. And it turns basically two wires into like 16 outputs. So we're going to use that to control all uh, the two drive motors. And then probably also inevitably the digging motors. Right. Um, I think just want to check really quick here. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Yeah. So we'll go through this first. Here's a snapshot of the power budget. Um, further on the right for the sheet, it's a really long sheet, so forgive me in advance. Um, one of our um, team members, Guru, did a really good job on this and made it so that we have the operational um, uh, parameters as well as the um, load install parameters. So um, this is a snapshot of what we have so far. Um, you know, while operational, we can expect to see around maybe 13 and a half um, amps of current. Um, and if we, I mean, if we, you know, run it around the ballpark, roughly 240 watts of power consumption while operational. Um, just going off of memory here, from what I saw, uh, for stall current, that would be, um, it was 20 amps, and I think something roughly around what would be 400 or 500 watts max 
add stall current. So that's if the motors are pushed to a point where um, they're reaching their like their maximum capacity of how much they can actually put out. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say we could open up the link. I mean, maybe maybe for the sake of time. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, and then I think we have we have one more. Yeah. So um, just kind of going off of um, what was discussed before, 14 gauge for primary power distribution. So to the motors, the motor controllers, um, anywhere that 24 volt bus is going to be distributing power. We're planning on using 14 gauge wire, 18 gauge for signals. So anywhere where we could expect to see pulse width modulation, um, we'll be using 18 gauge wire and then 12 gauge for the primary battery. Um, it's just like to show, um, I don't know if you can see it, but this is about the size of 14 gauge wire. It's not too bad, but 12 gauge is going to be, you know, probably about like yay so larger, right? Um, we're trying our best to make sure that we don't add extra weight to the robot. Um, so for just what has been found online in terms of like power charts or, you know, current load to wire gauge, um, this is what we think would be best. But again, please critique us if we're wrong or if we could be using a better system or a better wire gauge. And then we'll be using USB to connect the cameras. Um, and I'm pretty sure the LiDAR as well, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Um, and then we're having two separate cables ordered for the motors themselves. Um, that's a motor encoder and a test debug cable. And then for our harnessing purposes, we're planning on buying or having donated individual spools of wire for the 14 and 18 gauge um, wires that will then um, terminate, solder, um, group together with the um, insulating sleeve and then route throughout the robot. So I think that's all we have for the electrical slide, right? If we go forward one here. Um, yeah. Um, I guess, any questions? questions I know the electrical electrical part. <laughs> yes, I know earlier you mentioned, you just touched on it, the possible failure of uh, being fully autonomous. Yeah. You said there's a possibility. Mm -hmm. um, I don't understand what how how large is that possibility? Is that something that we're kind of like expecting and prepping to kind of fail safe, or is that something that we're just hoping doesn't happen? So the robot has two modes, right? It has the autonomy mode where it can navigate based on the instructions it's provided and the algorithm which corrects it in the arena, right? If if that fails, um, which brings in the second mode, the radio command mode. So that would be using radio being, in this case, wireless Wi-Fi, so which is being interfaced with the ESP32 um, and the Wi-Fi router itself. Um, and in the, in the arena will uh, be our, you know, our computer station. So that would be a 27 second delay for those commands though, to emulate what conditions on the moon would be like. Um, so, to the moon. The strategy and the idea, um, and correct me if I'm wrong here, is that if if it's un, if it gets to a point where it's unable to navigate, like just based on the data it has, then we resort to sending signals through wireless. I hope that explains it well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, any other questions before we move on to the software side? Okay. Um, so, um, I am not a software lead, um, but I'm speaking on behalf of the software team for their slides. Uh, bear with me here as, uh, this is not my expertise, but internships in the past have taught me how to roll with the punches and to go with information that's available. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to 
I'm going to move along here to the next slide and kind of just go over um, the general idea of how we're planning to um, implement our algorithm um, and its economy into the robot. Um, so this is our um, our process flowchart for what will be the the whole process. Um, it will start by going through the boot up and the initialization to localizing the area um, that's around it. It then proceeds into pathing. So if you can kind of think of like, um, you know, as the robot's moving through the arena, right? It's going through and um, producing a map of the area around it. And in turn has to produce a path that's going to get from point A to point B. So if it's taking dirt, well, dirt, um, lunar soil from one area to another, right? It needs to generate a path that it can effectively do so. So when it gets to that path, once it's um, displaced itself, it begins to excavate. So collect that lunar soil, um, move the substrate from point A to B, dump it, and then move back to the excavation location and repeat the cycle until the process is complete. Um, and I think the next slide goes over, yeah, it goes over that a little more. Um, so four motors, right, two drive, uh, two digging, all controlled individually by PWM, um, and a linear actuator to raise and lower it. Um, we have an enable and disable. So obviously we have the kill switch, right? But this is separate from that. This is not referring to the kill switch. This is referring to um, initializing the system, like kind of how we saw in the previous slide. Um, Raspberry Pi, so the main controller, um, to a Raspberry Pi that will handle the image processing. Um, so you can kind of think of this as like your primary controller and then your secondary controllers are connected to it, um, which is in turn, <clears throat> excuse me, which is in turn controlling the rest of the system. So the motors, which includes the drive, the raising and lowering, the digging, right? Um, and that's all interfacing with the computer side and the software side. So we'll go to the next slide here. And again, please bear with me if I've made any mistakes. I'm sure there's, um, I'm sure there are, you know, um, things that I could explain better here. Uh, so just let me know if at any point um, anything needs to be corrected. Yeah. Yeah. Can I this yeah, absolutely. Actually, that's a good. One. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so this is sort of how our our hardware is going to work in a way that will make it easy to for the software team to develop. So this is also slightly outdated because two of these motors will have a, a secondary controller now. So if you pretend that there's like a box between motors four and three, then that's how this uh, setup would be. But Basically, we start with the controller, sort of like Eric was showing. There will probably be two pies, but we're, we haven't determined that yet. So the main controller will send the it will receive commands from the laptop if we're sending it manual commands. Um, the commands are going through from the laptop to through um, an Ethernet switch uh, that NASA provides, and then we have a wireless access point um, that will basically talk to the rover, uh, which it says right there. Um, and then we have the Wi-Fi uh, ESP32 inland microcontroller that's on the rover, which is in, independently from the Pi, it's hooked up to the PWM controller. So in the event that the Pi for some reason has an error and we can't control with the Pi autonomously, then the ESP32 board can just pick up and start being controlled uh, manually. Um, and like I said, there's another, not a PWM board, but a PWM controller that controls motors three and four for digging specifically. And then, yeah, motors one and two are directly on the regular PWM. And that's, uh, cool. Thanks, um, And then, so moving on from the hardware breakdown to the software breakdown, um, for localization, uh, we'll be using these. <laughs> I don't believe the medium has been determined yet um, as to whether that will be, um, you know, 
light based or radio based or just image based, so light based, um, mounted to the walls of the arena. Each beacon will be a different color for identification. The robot will detect the angle between the beacon and itself using the pixels at which the color was detected. Um, and with what we know so far, the beacons that are placed will be able to use a combination of angles. So you can kind of think of like where the robot is positioned locally. It can determine where it is by using um, its image mapping and the angles that are calculated um, from the robot's image sensors. So it's a combination of this to um, generate a localization that the robot can use to navigate um, around the arena with. So right, next slide. Um, and then for the software breakdown, um, we're using a um, open source um, library slash it's not an operating system in the way you would think about like Windows or Linux. This is more of a controller backbone and collection of libraries uh, for controlling robots autonomously or semi-autonomously. Um, this uh, library slash backbone will be handling most of our cross-system communication. So um, you can kind of think like the communication between the Pi and the individual uh, boards and sensors that you saw earlier. Um, and we'll also be handling some of the code for our um, sensor processing. Um, I can't speak much to Ross as much as I would like to, but I will say it's um, it's a very, what's nice about it is it's kind of like OpenCV Python, which I'm, I'm just learning about this, but it's literally a whole library for just for image processing. Um, it's similar to that in that it's a whole library for robot processing, which is why we're opting in to use it versus, you know, making our own from scratch. We would prefer to use something that has already been implemented that we can implement into our own system. Um, I think, is that it? Or... Okay, yeah, so here's the process flow. I think we just went over that. So we'll go over to the next one real quick here, I think. And I think this is your slide. So this is my slide. So for fundraising, we have, we are doing a fundraiser with uh, Krispy Kreme as part. Nah, I can't talk today. Uh, we're doing a fundraiser with Krispy Kreme where it's going to be about $14. You, get a, you can order a digital gift card for the digital dozens um, programs, and 50% of the proceeds comes back to Lunabotics. So about seven dollars from your order comes back to Lunabotics. Yeah. So your your Monday morning donuts, yeah. or you know, if you're buying, you know, donuts for your coworkers, um, please don't buy don't uh, don't buy Dunkin'. Buy from us instead. <laughs> and, um, um, if anybody's interested, we can provide copies of that QR code. Yeah, we'll have afterwards. I'll have copies coming around, and I'll send it in the Discord. For everyone soon, just catching up some stuff. Um, just for the record, that's a joke. I love Dunkin' Donuts, especially when my coworkers buy them. Um, but I think that's it, right? Yeah. Unless there's any other slides. Nope. All right. All right. So we'll open it up to questions. <laughs> I was gonna say. Can you guys pull some old slides, slides, and just give an overview of the uh, project real quick for anyone that's not familiar? Uh, kind of the premise of the competition. Yeah, absolutely. Um, while we're pulling that up, I can maybe just lowball give like a premise of the competition for anyone who's new here um, or who's just learning about this. Um, Lunabotics is a NASA held computation, uh, computation, wow, you know where my brain is, competition uh, that's held in Florida annually. Um, it's a design competition for making a robot that um, essentially is designed to um, make construction um, um, construct plans on the moon basically. So you can kind of see, I mean, here's a good image of like what, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the NASA Artemis mission. Um, NASA, to my knowledge, um, 
as an outsider is planning on at some point sending a um, another mission to me. Um, this competition is in part um, associated with that slightly in that it is um, preparing future students for what will inevitably be another flight to the moon. And what it's basically doing is you're building a robot about, I don't know, about the size of this chair, I guess maybe less tall, but about yay size, right? That's going to take lunar soil from one location and take it to the next and build structures with it. Right. Um, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, so to kind of build on what Eric was saying, uh, as well as giving students a good opportunity to learn and gain practical experience doing something like this, uh, it also gives NASA the chance to discover new ideas that these students come up with and potentially use them on the future missions, right? So while the robots that they send to the moon may not be this scale, uh, the, the functionality is basically the same, where the goal is to build these berms that you see here. Of course, this may not be entirely accurate because it is a depiction, but, um, uh, you know, with the uh, development of reusable rockets and things of that nature, we want to develop areas where they can take off and land, and then the berms serve the purpose of being a blast shield to protect these, you know, structures which may be in close proximity to these takeoff and landing sites from that blast of the rocket. Uh, I think we've got a layout of the arena here. So a big part of the competition is automation um, because it takes a lot of effort and people to, you know, <coughs> sit there and actively control a robot on the moon, let alone a handful that may be building these berms. So NASA does give a large chunk of points towards your robot if it is autonomous. So here's a quick layout of the arena. It is 6.88 meters long by five meters tall, I guess. Uh, there is this column in the middle that is part of the arena and we're not allowed to hit that. So the arena is made up of a few different zones. You have your starting zone. Uh, the guidebook says it can be, your robot may be placed anywhere in this starting zone. There is no specific orientation that it will be placed in. Uh, and then you've got your obstacle zone. So you have to traverse through this area to get to the excavation zone and construction zone. You are not allowed to excavate in this area. You also get points deducted if you hit these boulder or these craters and these rocks. Um, you know, I list the size over there on the other side of the screen, about 30 to 40 centimeter sized rocks and 40 to 50 centimeter diameter craters. Now this, we don't believe I don't think it says in the guidebook, but we're pretty sure this may, this isn't the exact layout, right? Like these craters can be anywhere, these rocks can be anywhere. This is just an example, and there are smaller rocks that we may run into that aren't like, you know, technically part of the big, you know, rocks that they place in there. So the goal would be to hopefully autonomously traverse through this obstacle zone to the excavation zone, where we will then obviously excavate some of this lunar soil and then traverse over to the construction zone. And then the bird building zone. You're also not allowed to excavate this construction, the, the, this construction zone. Now, your berm that you build has to be in this little box here. Anything outside of this box does not count towards your points. You are scored on how much cubic meters of soil you can place in this box. Any questions? Yes. Uh, can, uh, does the lunar soil need to be placed in any particular way in that berm, or is it just? It does, you not care. It how just you has to be in the berm. Right. As long as it's in that box, they don't care how you build it, as long as you put the soil there. Um, any other questions regarding this particular topic? Let's go to the, uh, the deliverables. All right, so here's just a quick overview of what we need to give to NASA as part of the competition, right? So things we've already done would be the project management plan. That was kind of like our application into the competition, basically how we plan on running our team and accomplishing this goal of developing a robot that can be taken to the competition. Um, some things we've got coming up are the STEM engagement report and this 
uh, safety presentation that we have to do. Basically, the safety presentation just outlines some steps we've taken, uh, you know, whether that's material data sheets. Uh, for example, we're looking to build a test space just like 10 feet by 10 feet with. What? Maddie, do you want to speak to that or do you want me to cover it? Maddie's not going to charge you on that. Test. Building a testing space? Yeah. Um, yeah, we're working on building a testing space here uh, in one of the annexes, the engineering annexes. And it'll be about a maybe like um, 10 foot by 10 foot sandbox, essentially filled with some sort of lunar regolith simulant, probably dolomite limestone. Yeah, so lunar simulant simulant. Um, we found a sponsor that is willing to provide us with close to six tons of crushed limestone. Three tons of crushed limestone, 6,000 pounds, my bad. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so that stuff isn't necessarily, it's not the worst thing for you, but it is not good to breathe in. So if we can kind of outline steps we've taken to keep people from getting injured by ingesting and breathing in the stuff, you know, that's something that would be good to put on that presentation. Um, as far as the STEM engagement report, so we have to reach out to local schools and kind of teach classes on STEM, right? Related to the Artemis mission. Now, how we go about doing that is not too crazy specified. Um, in the guidebook, it says we're supposed to go to high school and middle schools and do one direct and one indirect STEM engagement. So the indirect STEM engagement would be just teaching a class, asking questions, just very, very classroom based. Whereas the direct STEM engagement would be very like half of it hands on and half of it classroom. So you teach them how to code some stuff about robotics, uh, you know, adjacent to the competition, and then give them a platform which they can learn on physically, right? So whether that's a small Arduino bot, whether you want to go to a first robotics team and help them their competition, which would also be helpful here. Um, however you go about doing that, we are scored on that. And then we have a proof of life video due in April, which just shows that our robot is working and is almost ready to go to competition. And then we have the actual competition. Here. I think that about covers the outline of the competition. Any, any questions? Yes. I have some questions here from Christopher Pestek. He's tuned in on YouTube, on okay. YouTube Live. Um, he is a engineering program manager from HX5. He has some questions here that I'll ask like on his behalf. So the first one is, do we have a system level summary of how we're doing against guidebook requirements? Like, do we have a, a list of deliverables that we're making sure that we meet? Yes, we do. We've got, we've got an Excel sheet as far as the deliverables when they're due and what progress we've made so far towards that. Um, Anything I can answer to specifically, like what he's looking for, or is that about covered? Yeah, so I have three more questions. So, for example, are we within the one by five meter by 0.75 by 0.75 meter dimensions? The answer yes. to that is yes. Um, are we within the 80 kilogram mass limit? And yes. following that, do we have a mass allocation breakdown by subsystem? By subsystem, yes. So, if we look through the build materials again on the slideshow, <laughs> at the bottom of the build materials, along with the price, it also gives an allotted. So we make sure that each of the components needed by each sub team totals up to under our required weight. We're turning out ones. And can you put that to me in kilograms in common form? Probably <laughs> 50 to 60 kilograms. We're at about 50 to 60 kilograms right now out of our you know max 80. So we're doing pretty good. Um, is this Sorry, All right, so for example, here's our. It's not on here. We don't have it on here currently. Okay, but but you know it? Yeah. Can you get it to me real quick? Uh, 54 uh, kilograms. For just the mechanical? Yeah. Okay, so mechanical is currently at 54 kilograms. Go ahead and scroll down to the electrical. No overestimate? Mm -hmm. right. So. Yeah. Um, all right, and then here's our mechanical build materials. You can see it lists the weight. We're at about 16 for the mechanical, so electrical. to electrical, sorry, up to about 70. And then does computer really add that much? I feel like theirs was. Well, computer is part of electrical. Okay, <laughs> we'll go to the wiring. 
Is that? I don't believe there's weights. Oh, there's weights. In there. Yep. So, and then about a little under two and a half kilograms. So we're sitting about 73, and mechanical said their estimate of 54 would, if anything, be an overestimate. So, okay. thank you for your questions. Any other questions? I have a question for the mechanical team. I don't know, maybe it's just not really clear in the CAD model you guys have posted, but how exactly are you taking the dirt that you excavate from the little scoopers you have into the big bucket? It doesn't look like it's like angled or anything. I just, I guess I'm not seeing how I, that works. I mentioned that uh, you can see in the small buckets, I mentioned that there was no like bottom or back to the bucket. Um, you can see it in the top left picture depicted up there. Top left. Yeah. It's kind of like a shell you can see of like a scoop. So when it scoops, when it reaches the top arc of that circle, the material is going to fall out of the scoop into the small little arms that are coming off of the bed there. If you can see in the bottom left picture, and then that is going to slide it towards the middle of the bed. Oh, okay. I see now. Gotcha. Yeah, it's kind of hard to see if anybody else is having trouble. It's right here. There, there is a little bucket here. So once those buck, those uh, scoops reach towards the top, the sediment will fall down into this bucket and channel into the, into the main. You know, gotcha. Container. I didn't realize that was underneath inside scoops from the picture. Mm -hmm. My bad. Yes. I have a similar question. How will the uh, soil be retained until we uh, can bring it to where we need to uh, replace it? Is there like a uh, like where this hinge would be. There's not a model at the moment for that picture. Yeah, I don't. We don't feel as if that's going to be an issue. I don't think we're going to face high enough uh, movement speed forward to really face that kind of issue. Um, considering we're also muddy craters, we'll stay on a pretty level surface majority of the, or hopefully the whole competition. So that shouldn't come out to be an issue. Uh, do we have a system to uh, eject the dirt? Yep. The uh, linear actuator is going to raise the bed up. Oh, yep, it'll slide out. Do you guys know what the maximum oil is? I think they all know. <laughs> uh, for anybody that couldn't hear online, uh, he just asked if there was a way to retain the soil in the bed until we're ready to dump it. Um, there is not, uh, simply because we don't feel that A, we're going to accelerate fast enough to uh, lose any from our movements alone, and then uh, with our autonomy and ability to just uh, move around craters and obstacles, we don't think we're ever going to be at a high enough, like steep enough angle for it to fall out of the bed. And then you had a question online was, do you know how fast the robot will move across the ground? Would you have an estimate for how long it takes to complete the site preparation? For how, how, how fast do you think the robot is going to move on an average? Two to four. Two to four. Two to four miles an hour. Two to four miles an hour. As far as how long it's going to take for us to, right? Uh, yeah. So as far as how long it's going to take us to complete the whole cycle itself, um, I don't think we have that estimate yet. But you know, that's something we can simulate a little more. But we think it's going to be at least sub thirty minutes. So uh, hopefully, that's something, that's something we have planned uh, to find out in testing. Okay. Yeah. So we did a lot in testing. You know time in our in our build time. So that is something we can look at when we do tests uh, and we actually get the chance to uh, model our whole digging cycle and then track how fast it's going to be able to realistically move and turn in the sediment. Um, but yeah, I we feel fairly confident that we can get at least one whole cycle in in 30 minutes. So it's something we can, we can figure it out. Yeah. Using numbers. Any other questions? No, I thought that's, that was the only one. Okay. Good question. It was. That is a very good question. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Mac. Yeah, so I noticed that the, I think it was the fire suppression system was new. I didn't really see that last time. Could you, could you talk a little more about that? I guess, like what, what's, how are you detecting the fires? What's are you like? Just tell me a little more about it, I guess. Alex, you wanna or do you want me to? Okay, so 
As far as the fire suppression system, this is a relatively new idea that we've you know, implemented. Uh, realistically, this won't be used on the moon because you know, there's no, or at least very little air up there. So a fire up there would be pretty unrealistic. Uh, as far as safety for our equipment and our testing space and the people working on the robot, this is something that we're looking at implementing. You know, as far as how we detect the fires, uh, whether that's the visual sensor, whether that's just the temperature sensor, the photoresistor, uh, however we're going to implement it, that's something we can look at. But it's mainly just there to, if we do have, like, let's say, an electrical fire, worst case scenario, um, that it helps extinguish the fire or at least get to the point where somebody else can grab a fire extinguisher so that we lose a the minimal amount of electronics that need to reorder things and B, keep people safe. It's a very good question. Thank you. Yes, Chrissy. So I'm not sure exactly how you guys are putting it in there, but would it be easier instead of having an entire like fire suppression system, a way to instead of detecting fire, detect heat right before fire and then right. have it cut everything off? I have no idea about electrical things. So maybe this is delusional, but like if there was a way to detect either like with a thermocoupler or something, or isn't that what a fuse so does? We, we could we put like a thermistor sensor fuse. in it that, can, that is within the temperature range and then use like, it's like they're usually their resistance base and we could probably tie it straight into one of our microcontrollers. And just have it like cut the power before anything lights on fire? Yeah, so we have to have temperature sensors kind of throughout the robot and that could get fairly pricey and a little complicated. One measure we are taking to help prevent uh, fires due to like, you know, excess current is we're going to implement uh, a way to sense how much current is going through the wire itself. So like, let's say the robot hits a rock, can't move, and for some reason the autonomy isn't realizing that it's hitting a rock, right? It didn't see the rock, it's just stuck. So by being able to measure how much current is going through it electronically, there's several ways we can do that that we're looking at. We have sensors. We have sensors. We have sensors. Um, we can sense that the robot is approaching its stall current and cut power to it. And then the computer then knows, hey, I can't move this way. Let's back up and find a different way to move. So ideally, we wouldn't have any issues with overcurrent in the first place. But this would just be kind of like a last ditch resort if something were to happen with the battery or whatever. Okay. Yes? Um, yeah, I really like the idea. I definitely don't want to, you know, say you guys shouldn't do it or anything it's 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 kind of innovative i've not seen it done mm. in a robot before um but are you th i'm i'm worried how the judges are going to interpret it if you guys are trying to get like some points out of like considering this we may not even use it for the actual competition this may just be for safety in regards to like the testing phases and you know okay. this could be something that we include in our safety presentation slides like hey uh realistically this wouldn't go on an actual rover but in the interest of our own safety and the safety of our equipment and our testing space this is something we implemented uh, yes so what what i'm looking at that is concerning me is requirement eight for your uh robot construction requirements pretty much explicitly says if it can't be used off world or would it be used like in a lunar environment? Right. Then that's why we wouldn't necessarily use it in the competition. It would just be for testing. Um, yeah. So like, definitely go for it. I just want to make sure you guys didn't didn't right. think it would, because there's other things you can do with safety. Like Kirsty was talking about having interlocks for thermal couples. Like I do that mm -hmm. um, a lot. Like have the system trip itself off if I hit a thermal limit. Um, and they would consider that, you know, that would actually address the issue and also gain points towards your systems engineering design. Right. And would you recommend just kind of putting that towards the battery since we have other measures in place to prevent? Uh, yeah, the batteries like are what the batteries are what would be your most likely component to burst into flames. Honestly. Right. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, a short circuit. I hope you guys have some fusing in the system. A short circuit should be good. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
breakers and whatnot work. You you have the fuse so that way the circuit can't stay shorting long enough to cause a fire. Um, but I've definitely seen a lot of batteries on a lot of robots burst in flames. Um, the the battery systems are usually your kind of ignition source if you're thinking that way. At that point, let's just hope it is an electrical issue and not an issue with like the chemicals in the battery itself because there wouldn't be anything we could do about it at that point. But we do have measures in place to prevent uh, things like shorts and uh, approaching stall currents and keeping our motors from burning themselves up. What, things with that nature. What chemistry is your battery? We chose lithium iron phosphate batteries. Okay, those, those ones very rarely burst into flames. That's one of the nice things about them. So, uh, But yeah, you generally just don't, you want to look at what the battery can support and don't, you know, command a current from it that right. is outside the spec for a significant amount of time. Um, iron phosphates will take some abuse, but eventually they will go like any other battery. Okay. And then our, our smaller battery pack, just for powering the Pi, like the main controller, is uh, nickel metal hydride. Or, yeah. Nickel metal hydride. They're like 2.5 volt batteries. Yeah, okay. Anybody else have any questions? Yes. Do they make complete bill of materials for the robot? I don't think so, specifically because we got our different components, like our different parts from different places. For example, we had a sponsor that was willing to cover the vast majority of the electrical bill of materials. Okay. And then as far as the rest of it, the suppliers that we would use would be completely different. Mm -hmm. So it just wasn't uh, practical for us. There was no real reason to make one aside from budgeting. And that's just as simple as adding up each individual one. Okay. Uh, did you want a full bill of materials? Possibly, yeah. Okay, we can make that happen. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? No? All right. Well, thank you guys all for coming. Uh, there is probably some leftover pizza over there. I haven't checked, but feel free to help yourself if there is. We've got some bottles of water left still. Uh, again, I can't express enough how much I appreciate you guys coming and how much. Thank you.